Cool. So thank you so very much for coming back online. We have spent a couple of sessions together and we've been talking all things brand and marketing. Up until now, we've really spent a lot of time uh, talking about you as a being and building out from a personal perspective where you are at, reconnecting with your sense of self. For those of you that are looking into kind of turning your side hustle into your main hustle or looking at starting up different businesses, um, we spoke a little bit around there. And then in our last session, we spoke around personal branding. So today is really where we're going to dive into some of the business stuff. I'm going to um, share my screen and jump into our presentation. Lovely. So what you see in front of you is a little bit of a journey that we've taken you on. I have spent some time this week also just doing a bit of research around what's been happening in the marketing world and where things are shifting and where we really should be focusing our energies going forward once we do enter into this new world. And with the president's announcement that things are going to start shifting back in that direction from the 1st of May already, um, our next session next week is going to delve quite deeper into that marketing side of things. So for today, we're going to start talking about business brands. And for me, the easiest and quickest way to explain what branding is, is for you to experience it. So I invite you to play. I invite you to play a game with us. Uh, what I'm going to do on the next slide is I'm going to bring up 12 brands. So if you really want to play, ideally when I'm in a classroom scenario, I ask my participants to take out a piece of paper and a pen and jot down the numbers one to 12. So if you want to do that, feel free to do that. Write it down one to 12. And, um, or if you want to play on your phone, or if you just want to play visually by watching the screen, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up 12 logos and a portion of those logos has been hidden so i'm going to give you a minute i'm picking up my phone and i'm going to put a timer on and what i want you to do in that one minute is try to identify as many logos or brands that you can good so we're ready to play i'm just putting my timer on and i'm going to the next screen so let's play everybody one minute And we're down to 30 seconds, no pressure people, just 30 seconds left. And 10 seconds. And your time is up. So um, we're going to chat a little bit just now about what that experience was like. But let me reveal to you the 12 iconic South African brands. So I want you to have a nice look at the screen and mark yourself. How many did you get out of 12? Did you get 12 out of 12? Did you get 8 out of 12? 2 out of 12? Just have a look at those brands and just get a sense of um, how many you were able to identify. Good. Now I want us to start decoding what happened when we played that quick game. So let's, let me take you through a scenario. I don't know if you've ever applied your mind to this. Just how many brand interactions you have on a normal day, not a lockdown day, from the time you open your eyes in the morning until the minute you step out of your front door for the day. Whether you are going to school, whether you are going to university, whether you are going to a job, whether you are going into your own business, um, I want you to apply your mind to how many brand interactions you have had just in that period of time. So let's journey. 
let's let's go on a journey together you're lying in your bed your eyes open for the day and you are ready to get into it i don't know what the first thing is that you do for the day whether you are reaching over onto your bedside table for a glass of water for your cell phone in my case it's always some sort of lip balm um, and you get up off the bed and you swing your feet down and they land on the floor just in that interaction already we need to start thinking about how many brand interactions we've had. That bed that we are sleeping in, does it have a pillow? Does it have a blanket? Does it have a duvet? Is there a duvet cover? What are the sheets like? When your feet swing down onto that floor, is that floor concrete? Is it carpeting? Is it wooden floors? Is it tiling? And then you stand up and we walk into that one room that is filled with a plethora of brand interactions. That bathroom. So from the minute you are in that toilet with your toilet paper, your soap, your shampoo, your toothpaste, your toothbrush, um, every single thing that's in that shower, think about how many brand interactions you are already having. Now we'll fast forward to that moment where you are stepping out to leave for the day. Whether you have prepared breakfast for the family, whether you've had breakfast yourself, whether you switch a radio on that's playing in the background, whether there's a TV playing in the background, if so, what content am I consuming while that TV or that radio is playing? Whether I'm doing breakfast, what's going into that breakfast? We have had hundreds of brand interactions by the time we leave the house for the day already. And I'm not only talking about brands that you see in front of you on the screen that are name brands and specific products or retail brands out there, but also brands that are lifestyles. So am I choosing to be to listen to rock music? Am I choosing to listen to R&B music? Am I choosing to be a news consumer in the morning? Those are all brands that we tie ourselves into. Now, us as business owners, as working professionals, as students, etc., we have make, made the decision to go out there and build a business and add into this world of brands that exist already. I have quite a visual mind. So I always imagine if I was out there in the world and I was interacting with the world, imagine if a brand just popped up above my head every single time I interacted with something and how dynamic those pop-ups would be. How those brands would be changing on a split second by split second basis as my eyes move, as I listen, as I hear, as I talk, as I eat, as I breathe, as I sleep, as I taste. Those brand interactions are changing. Now let's go to the supermarket together. We got to do our monthly shopping. We've got our trolley and we enter the shopping. We enter the store already. You have made a branding decision based on which store it is that you do your shopping at. And that, that has a whole lot associated with it already. And now we take this trolley and we're going through the store aisle by aisle by aisle. There are some purchasing decisions that are no longer even conscious anymore. We need not even think about some items, some products that we need to purchase. Without a conscious thought, your hand reaches out to the shelf and you take one, two, three, whatever of that item and it goes into the trolley. As we go a little bit more, we may see that there's a new product that's launched, there's a new variation or a new flavor of something that we usually buy and we think, hmm, maybe I do want to try that. The reason I'm taking you on this journey through a shopping center is, I want you to really start to switch on your purchasing decisions and switch on your consciousness around the brands that you choose to engage with on a daily basis. So what does this mean? There are some brand interactions that we have that are highly conscious. I need to think about, mm, do I wanna buy that? Don't I wanna buy that? This is something new. Uh, maybe I wanna try it, maybe I don't wanna try it. But those truly powerful, truly powerful brands are those that are so deeply ingrained in your system and in your life and in your lifestyle now that they are no longer a conscious purchasing decision. Those brands sit in your unconscious and subconscious mind and they now inform your behaviors on a deep, deep level. Just let that settle for you because there's so much of power that these brands hold that actually at some point, in some circles, it can be quite manipulating because, because they are so deeply ingrained in your mind that you are no longer the decision maker anymore. Those brands can very easily subliminally put additional messaging in there that starts to form your belief system.
So really start to think about the brands that you engage with on a daily basis and whether they are still your conscious decision around it, whether they have shifted or changed to an extent over time and whether it actually still resonates with you anymore. So us as business owners choose in this world that is just flooded with millions of options and brands and hundreds and thousands of options for this specific area that we are choosing to go into as a business owner. Um, how am I as a brand builder now consciously building out my content in a way that starts to create eventually in the long term, those unconscious and subconscious associations that happen with our brand? So this is the process of brand building, and this is the power that brands hold in our lives. So let's look into some of the practicalities around building it. Good. As a starting point to this, um, what I quickly want to touch on is naming a business. There, it's really the very first engagement that we have with the brand is its name, before its look and feel, before its color palette, before its tone, before its style. The first interaction we have with the brand is its name. So what I want you to do right now is if you already have a business in existence, I want you to really audit it. I want you to start asking yourself the questions aligned to the next couple of slides and um, get a reality check around whether it's doing you a service or a disservice. So on this slide, how do I name my business? I want you to start thinking about the name that you chose, how hard or easy it is to spell, whether it could be limiting, so if we have a long-term view of it, whether it could be limiting on the long-term. In the digital space, this is how people are consuming content and how people are starting to learn about new businesses and engaging with them. If I conduct a search, how does it work digitally? And again, if there's a specific domain that you want to own, if it's a .com, .co, .za, the world of domains has evolved rapidly now. So we could create a domain aligned to what it is that the business does. So it could be business name .bakery now. So think about how you want that to translate in the digital space. And we ideally want a name that conveys some sort of a meaning. Uh, from a legal perspective, if there's some IP, if there's specific information that you want to be protecting down the line, you want a name that also can be trademarked uh, in the long run. We want to conduct a search with your legal body to see if there are competitors in the space that have similar names. You want to assess whether it's catchy. You want to try out the name with your network and see um, how it sits, how it's received. And again, specifically in the South African context where we have so many official languages, we have so many dialects, um, you really want to test it out with people who are first language English speakers, but also people who aren't. Um, a very important one is to speak your name out. So often people build brands for paper and or, or for a screen, but when it's actually a living, breathing organism that you really want to go viral and you want people to talk about, how does it sound when it's spoken? And there are lots of resources available if you are starting from scratch to um, work out an idea or brainstorm names. And then at the end of the day, you really are the one who has to own this name and sell this name. So ensure that personally it works for you and that you're happy with it. If you have a business name already, you can do what I call a smile and a scratch test. The first one is really to assess whether it's simple and whether there's some meaning attached to it. And when I say meaning, I don't necessarily mean this heavy, deep, helping meaning. I mean, it's wonderful if it has that, but the meaning could be something that's quirky and light and fun. The meaning could be something that's different. The meaning could be something that's solving a very specific problem, but think about whether there's meaning attached to the name. Can the name lend itself easily to the visual space? Can it lend itself easily to us creating cool imagery around it that creates a very clear mental picture around what your business does in your potential client's mind? Does the brand have legs to carry itself? So if we need to build it out, is there space for play um, and evolution and innovation in it? And some of the most successful brands in the world are ones that evoke an emotion. And those are really powerful because it's in that emotion evoking that it creates a personal connection with someone and we're able to relate to it. Does it empower, entertain, engage, enlighten? When we look at the scratch test, again, we want to look at the spelling. 
We have worked with businesses over the years who have come to us with such interesting business names. They obviously would have gone onto some sort of brainstorming tool or brainstorming website that combines different words, et cetera, to create a cool name. But when it's spoken or when it's spelt, it's really, really hard. So if you're on the phone with someone and you're giving them your email address and the domain, is it easy for you to say what your domain is or what the name is so that people get it easily? So think about the spelling. Think about copycat brands. And in some industries, this has done well. And in some industries, it's really frowned upon. So look at, depending on the nature of your business, um, what your competitors' names are like. And if there's potential for you to, to play off it, even the direct opposite of it in creating a unique space against them, or um, whether you wanna shy away from that entirely and go unique. Is your name too random? When people hear your business name, are they really not quickly getting a sense of what it is that your business does? Think about the randomness of the name. Names can be annoying. Um, I have a very dear friend who's a copywriter and you know, copywriters are writers and they create content for a living. So they live in a world of words. And she was so proud about the business brand that she had created to say to the world that I'm a writer. And she named her business Confab Agility. Confab Agility. Confab Agility. So we kept saying it over and over again. And after about three months into it, I said, oh, my dear friend, I have absolutely no idea. First of all, you are alienating and isolating a potential audience because they, number one, don't understand it. It's a hard word to say. And if people can't say it, there's a sense of disconnect that they feel with it and a sense of self-consciousness around saying it. It's such a it's such a subliminal thing that happens in the mind that creates a separation from the business as a result, and then you don't want to engage with it anymore. Is the business name too flat, too tame, too boring? Like really not fun enough? Um, think about that. The next point is a very common one that we make in our industries where we are so stuck in our terminology and in our jargon that we use that it's a curse of knowledge. Nobody else can get it. If your business is specifically structured only to service an industry, so for example, if you are doing, um, oh, recently we worked with a client who does air conditioning systems, and I didn't know the terminology HVAC, which is an acronym, H-V-A-C, which stands for the type of air conditioning system that's used. So he would keep saying, yeah, we're an HVAC specialist, we're an HVAC specialist. And I was like, what on earth is HVAC? I do not understand this. Apply your mind to that. And then he said to me, well, I only want to service facilities management companies. And if I say HVAC to a facilities management company, they know very specifically that this is who I want, this is what I'm talking about, and this is a service that I need for my business. So when it comes to jargon and only insiders getting it in curse of knowledge, it really is about you understanding intrinsically who your target market is and whether or not you are building a brand aligned for them or whether there are some outliers who could also benefit from the service offering um, who would need a more generic understanding of what the offering is. And we touched on the one around the name being hard to pronounce already. So when, when, when my partner Sands and I did training, entrepreneurial training with the Branson Center of Entrepreneurship a good couple of years ago, um, it was so beautiful when we were doing our training with them because in every aspect of what they do, they spoke about how when you do something, it's really great to get your basics in place and then look at how you are adding magic touches on top of it. So they spoke about working on brilliant basics and then magic touches. So I've taken the same approach here. Let's look at what the brilliant basics are around your brand. The brand needs to be a unique story that a customer recalls when they think about you. And this story, this is where that personal connection comes in that there's a story around this brand that makes me feel like you understand so deeply what need I have right now, what problem I need solved. And as a result, it's evoking an emotion with me. And as a result, I feel connected to you and I want to start engaging with you. So really think about what that unique story is around your brand because it creates the personal connection between you and your potential consumer. And then how can that relate into visual symbols? The reality is, to, in today's world, people consume information visually. So we've spoken about this before, whether it's imagery, flat imagery, whether it's video content, that's the quickest way that people are engaging with brands now. So how can the story translate well in a visual space? So here's the basics. 
The real basics around the brand. You want to ensure that you understand and you are clearly representing who you are, what you do, where you do it, who you do it for, and how you do it. Um, I'm leaving the why out. We'll talk about it at the end. Um, but these are the basics around it. So we had spoken about this briefly in a previous chat where today the pace at which people consume information, I always pick up my phone, is we consume information at the pace of a scroll, a scroll. So people are looking for information and they scroll and scroll and scroll. What in your information is that compelling and interesting that is going to cause a lag or a delay for someone to stop and say, oh, let me engage there and let me click there and let me go a little further there. Similarly, when we translate that into the space of a laptop or a desktop, if we are looking for a new product or service, I search by putting a couple of tabs out together and I quickly go through what it is that I want to know about that business. What I want to know about that business in relation to how they can solve the problem that I have or satisfy a need that I have right now. So who are they? How long have they been around for? Who's behind this specific idea? Can they solve it for me? Are they the best people to do it for me? Um, are they the experts? Who else have they worked with? Um, th that's the kind of information I want. But the basics are around, do they service clients in the geographical area where I live and work and function? The basics. If I can't see if you, whether you can serve me or not, I Quickly close that and I'm on to the next option and on to the next option and on to the next option. We all do this. It's the way that we consume information. So ensure that you are getting the basics in place and you are not frustrating an audience by um, leaving out information and creating gaps in their mind. And as a result, killing the opportunity for them to engage further. So ensure that you are answering all the basic questions. And then the last one really was this business concept that a man named Simon Sinek made really famous a good couple of years ago when he did his TED talk. Um, Simon Sinek's talk was called Start With Why or The Golden Circle. And it was, it was a, such a powerful talk that really went viral and sparked a whole new movement in how people build brands and businesses, which says that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, People buy why you do it. So how are you building out your why? And for me, this really is that powerful, powerful story that starts becoming associated with your brand and creates that connection with a potential client. So I'll just go into a small business case um, example. There was an entrepreneur who we had um, engaged with many years ago, at, again, at the Branson Center. And she had put out a whole range of hair care products for ethnic hair in South Africa. This was probably going back about six years ago. Those products are common, common, commonly used now in the space, but it was so powerful because her why was so strong in that when she had given birth to her daughter and, her, and she wanted hair care products for her daughter's beautiful natural hair, and she wanted this nourished, but she couldn't find the right products in the market. And the ones that she did use were damaging her daughter's hair and actually causing eczema. So she went and created a unique range of natural hair care products specifically made for the ethnic hair. And there was a deeply personal story associated with her why in that I will take care of you the way I'm taking care of my own daughter. So every single thing that I put in that product, rest assured, it's going to be natural. It's going to be good for your skin. It's going to be good for your hair and it's going to be nourishing. There was such a strong why around that being a personal problem for her that as a result, Every single thing that she did was committed, her product development, her brand development, her positioning, her marketing, how easily, with what ease you can actually procure the product online or in the retail space, that energy was brought into the, how she did every single thing from there. So really give some thought to your why and how you are making that visible to your audience. Let's talk about the magic touches, the magic touches that really make it work. And again, when uh, we went back to school a couple of years ago and took ourselves to brand and marketing training, uh, brand and marketing management about two years ago. There's a lovely article by um, a man named Adrian Porter. And these five key elements that define a brand. Again, if we've done our why, this informs your brand purpose. So your brand purpose really talks about your why. 
your brand positioning is about uniqueness, absolute uniqueness. And I remember in the early years of our business, there was such a lot of pressure around uniqueness that it used to be paralyzing. So don't feel the pressure around uniqueness. You really don't have to be the world's next Uber or the world's next Airbnb. Uniqueness can really come from such subtle, and in the innovation space, it's called incremental innovation, where it doesn't have to be the groundbreaking, blow it out the park innovation or uniqueness. Your uniqueness can come in a simple internal process that you make visible externally. So is it in how you process things? Um, at summertime, we have a uniqueness around our briefing process. So when we're taking on a, a new client, there's a unique summertime process that you will go through in our briefing. Is it in how you are delivering? Is it in how you are packaging? So understand what unique space you claim in a client's mind. Uh, always use the example that um, we are a design branding and marketing agency and the world is absolutely flooded with what it is that we do um, so there's the, the, there's a strong business case for why summertime in that the unique space that we work in is with a core passion around our country and our continent and understanding that in empowering SMEs, it's gonna to contribute to alleviating the poverty, the inequality and the unemployment that exists. So our unique space is every single thing that we do and we choose to take on will always feed into empowering, enabling and creating opportunities for success for small, medium and micro enterprises in the country, on the continent and then beyond the borders. So. Anyone who wants to be working with Summertime, once you go and look for us, you will see our engagement and our work in the space of entrepreneurial development, business development, working with incubators, accelerators, enterprise developers, and then directly with entrepreneurs to ensure their growth so that they contribute to job creation. So what is that for you? Really think about your brand positioning and your uniqueness. The next point around a brand promise. Um, and a brand promise, unfortunately, in the South African context can really help because we've become so used to a substandard um, level of delivery around promises that by just doing it, not even blowing up the park, but by just doing it, you can claim some uniqueness in a client's mind. So what is your brand promise? How are you guaranteeing that value is transferred to your client? And how are you consistently delivering on it? Number four is a fun one, and I really love working on this one with our clients, where we start to look at the brand persona. So if your business or your brand were a person, who would they be? Who would they be? Would they be older, more mature? Would they be younger? Would they be inclined to innovation? Or would they be solid and stable in what it is that they offer and, and really centered in the fact that it's adding value in the space for the next five, 10 years? Would they be serious? Would they need to be a, have a little bit more of a serious analytical focused mind? Or can they be a little bit more curious and fun and playful and informal? This really helps in setting a tone for how your brand communicates everywhere, externally and internally. So start to think about your brand personality and you will see that that will inform how you do everything. Um, the key is to keep that consistent. So don't shape shift your personality depending on who it is that you're talking to because then you will risk um, compromising some of your integrity and authenticity that you've built around the brand. So the persona needs to be solid and it is who you are and then how you engage with different audiences then speaks to that. So for example, in our business, Summertime is quite a fun and light and quirky brand. Um, if we had been in a classroom scenario, there's, you would have heard a song. If the song didn't work, I would have definitely sang the song. Uh, there's a Summertime song associated with our brand. Um, there's a lightness in terms of how we do everything. And when I send an email, irrespective to whatever level it is at an organization, if I feel like putting a smiley face in the email, a smiley face goes into the email. But in no way does that compromise the professionalism or the quality of what it is that we deliver. So please don't ever um, confuse a, a fun and a lighthearted um, brand persona with compromising professionalism and quality. 
And then at the end of it all is the brand identity. And this is really what people zoom into when we ask what a brand is, because we visual, it goes into, is it a logo? Is it a tagline? Is it, a, is it the building branding on it? Is it the way my website looks? It absolutely 100% is all of those things. But if we haven't done all the work that I've been talking about up until now, it won't inform well how you are building out your visual brand identity. So that is when I keep saying, I mean, us as an as a, as a agency, when we are briefed on a new brand development project by a client, the quality of the creative that we produce is only in direct relation to the quality of the brief that we get from the client. And the quality of the brief that we get from the client is informed by everything that we've spoken up about up until now. So really, truly understanding, a deep understanding of who you are, what unique problem you are solving, how you're claiming a unique space in a client's mind to solve that specific problem and how you're putting it out there. Understanding what your persona is, understanding what your personality is, having a clear understanding of what your promise is and how you're consistently delivering on that for a client. So brand identity. Seth Godin is a marketing brand and marketing guru, and I absolutely love this definition. And whenever I look at it, I often think that when I deliver this masterclass, actually all I ever need to do is leave this one slide on the screen and can talk to it for hours and hours and hours. And he says a brand is a set of expectations, memories, stories, and relationships that taken together account for a consumer's decision to choose one service over another. And this is so beautiful because when we work on brand, it becomes so business. It becomes so um, process and almost clinical. And at the end of the day, we have to remember that we are doing business with people. I keep going back to this. People do business with people. And at the end of the day, a person wants to have an expectation created. I have a problem. I need to buy a product. I need to buy a service. I have an expectation of the information that I need for you to share with me so that I know whether you are the person to deliver that product or service for me. And then it becomes, what am I building into this brand that creates a memory for me, creates a memory. And this speaks to that unique positioning in a person's mind. So what, when I think back to your brand, when I think back to summertime creatives, what is that memory that I have of that brand or that person or that being or that offering? And then the stories, um, the stories really become so infused in how you engage with that client. It could be content that you're putting out on your website. It could be testimonials. It could be um, showcasing some of the work that you've done. Case studies that says, hmm, those are the people who worked with X, Y, Z client and they were able to achieve this turnaround or that result, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or the stories could also be in personal engagement, which then becomes the relationship aspect of it. There's nothing, absolutely nothing more powerful for me than when someone in our network refers us on to someone else. And it's even more powerful for me when I hear them say it. And they say, you need to speak to the beat at summertime. That's Raksha. We need to speak to the art at summertime. And that's Sands. And we have built a uniqueness around our brand and a uniqueness, a uniqueness around our story and a uniqueness around how we quote, how we brief, how we deliver that our clients have taken it on for themselves in referring it to someone else. That's really the gold. So we really want to put a lot of effort into building there. That's what I wanted to share with you today uh, from a brand perspective. Uh, we've gone five minutes over our 30 minutes. I wanted to allow us just a couple minutes more for me to take any questions that you may have. And um, yeah, if there's any thoughts or reflections you've had around building out your own brands, if there's brands that you've interacted with in the marketplace that you want to share anything around from a building brand perspective, if there's any other magic touches that you want to share, let's just spend a few minutes engaging. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to go back here. And just open it up if anyone would like to say anything share anything please let me know hi raksha yeah so um the one slide where you've got you know choose a dot com domain you know it's you know it depends on your business dot uh, com you know when you first took off in the uh, early early 
around 2000, it was mostly depicting commercial entities. And nowadays that's not the case. So you'll have different types of domains, .co.za in Mauritius, we've got .mu, you'll, you'll get .co.mu.io, which is Indian Ocean. So I think when you're choosing a domain name, you gotta focus on your digital presence, you know, where, which country you are in. You gotta look at short, medium, and long-term goals as where you, how far your business will grow. Mm. And, 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 and yes, .com, I've noticed, is a little bit cheaper when you register the domain, but you know, look at other ones like .info, .biz, things, those type of domains as well, and see if they suit you. Look at the pricing structure. Look at your goals uh, and see, you know, long term, because you you would want to keep that domain name. Because usually a domain name is valid for one year, so in the second year you'd want to keep the same name. You know, things like that. So those are the things you'd have to think about. Such a lovely point, Ajay. Absolutely. You know, um, we finding also, um, and and just in the South African context, when uh, when we are working on websites for clients and just doing the research around their domains that space has just exploded like i was using the example of a bakery um that 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 domain space has opened up entirely and it's allowing us to play with creativity a little bit more and use that domain in such a clever way to communicate what it is that the business does so we've got every variation available to us we've had clients who have said they have such a serious long-term vision for their brand and owning that unique space in their client's mind from a business name perspective that they've gone on to buy every variation of the domains so that no one else would ever have that from the .com to .coza to every variation. So um, yeah, a domain is so important, especially in this world that we're living in right now, because it often becomes, it has the opportunity to become the first engagement that a potential client could have with your brand, if it's found via search engine, et cetera, and not via a personal relationship or link. Hmm. Nice one. Anyone else have anything they want to ask or add from a brand development perspective? Are you working on building out your own brands at the moment? Are you thinking there? Anyone hit a snag they want to talk about? Let me know. Or Sans, if there's anything you want to share. Okay. Okay, good. So thank you so very much for joining us. I was sharing that earlier this week, I enjoyed doing some research into what's actually happening in the space of marketing. And a lot of it is really organic. And it's speaking to the way that we've been living at the moment. And as a result, the way that we're engaging with the world has changed. So we've put together some really nice content for our final webinar in this series. I'm going to yeah, share, it, share that one wider um, because there's some insights that we're sharing around how the marketing mix has evolved and also how we should be thinking around marketing for this new, um, yeah, very new and very uncertain world that we're living in and that we are all gently starting to move back into. So thank you so much for your time this morning and I'll catch up with you again next week. Bye now.